So is this all? Okay. Yeah, welcome to the traditional uh, Hitchhiker's Guide uh, presentation. Um, um, and as usual, for the uh, developer days, I uh, chose a little different format than uh, at the Type 3 conference, because at the conference, uh, well, it's all more formal, and there are these business guys, and, and I trust you that you can understand some code I'll show you, and I uh, do some live coding, even uh, if some things might go wrong, that always can happen. But I trust that you are absolutely happy with that, and uh, so um, I prepared some nice code for, day, for today. Uh, as I've seen from the schedule, this is a very, very long talk. So uh, what we'll do is uh, every um, time and every now and then we'll do some little uh, exercise and you know run around the building and uh, just to get through all these five hours. Um, if you have any questions, then just shout in between and. Uh, I'd also like to welcome our uh, um, viewers from Austria and Switzerland and on the TV sets. <laughs> um, you can also hand in questions if you like, just uh, send them through Twitter and we'll look them up uh, at some point and answer them. Um, I, I thought recently that that would be a cool idea if, um, if you could... Uh, you know, put all the Twitter messages into the keynote presentation, and that seems to be possible technically, so next time we'll do that and uh, answer all the live questions. Okay, so, um, yeah. This is um, about Flow3 mainly, and um, I'll have a very, very, very short history of Flow3, uh, just that you know uh, what it's all about. And I'd like to know who was uh, attending the XBase talk yesterday. Jochen, I've not seen you there, I think. Uh, <laughs> okay, so um, I require all that knowledge. Um, well, the reason why we uh, started with Flow3 was mainly that the code we have in Type 3 is quite old. Uh, we found this very old code snippet here. Um, and it was still GPL version 01, I think. Um, and you see up there, it's even the old logo of Type 3. Um, and uh, as you know, we have a very long history. Uh, it's uh, 10 years. So in, in 1998, um, the first line of code was written, which currently still it exists. Um, so we have uh, 33 core team members since uh, this week at least. Although, I must say, uh, I had this number earlier in a slide and it was also 33 and I looked it up today and it's still 33. So we got two new members, what, what happened? But it was uh, that some very old inactive members uh, disappeared from the list. So, yeah, and in these 10 years, about half a million lines of code have been written, uh, which, um, and we have 300,000 lines approximately still today in Type 3. And um, as you know and can imagine, um, there are quite some uh, curiosities in, in there and uh, some things we wanted to clean up. So, um, um, we also wanted to do some major refactorings back then, and uh, seemed, it seemed not to be possible to uh, completely refactor TCE main, TCE forms. And this was basically the initial spark to uh, uh, go for a rewrite. So, um, Flow 3, I'd like to mention just a few words about um, why it's called Flow 3, for example. Um, You've heard that in earlier talks probably, but uh, the Flow experience, or as it's known today, the Flow 3 experience, um, is this mental state you probably have been in. It's kind of the perfect environment for you. You're absolutely concentrated, focused on a task. Um, 
And usually this task must be something challenging but doable and something you, uh, some, some task you put on yourself usually. And if all these um, requirements are met, you can go into this flow state and work for a few hours and do things you usually only do in a week or so. And uh, this was the basic idea to create a framework um, which allows you to not dis get distracted by infrastructure, just focus on what you actually want to uh, implement, what kind of business logic. And um, well, this uh, flow experience was discovered by an Hungarian uh, scientist and his name is a bit difficult to pronounce. It's kind of that, uh, although I must say that boy is American. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, that, that guy writes that he's pronounced uh, Mihai and then chicks sent me high. So if, if you pronounce it English, and chicks sent me high, that's something I can remember. <laughs> okay, so he's the father uh, of uh, the basic principle we have in Flow3. And Flow3 is an application framework. So. Um, if you compare it to other frameworks uh, which are out there and call themselves frameworks, uh, there's a difference. And uh, that's because uh, most of these um, are basically uh, libraries, code libraries. So they have certain components you can use. And, um, but the overall concept, uh, this is something you have to decide on and you have to figure out how to do the configuration, etc. So this is also why um, the most popular tutorial for Zen Framework, for example, takes actually two parts until you really start doing something business logic related. All the rest is setting up the bootstrap, etc. And Flow3 doesn't give you that much freedom in deciding everything yourself, but it has some conventions uh, which makes you get started right away. Do I hear some radio or something, or is it? Oh, no, it's people talking. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so uh, all this is package-based, so it's, you can compare it to uh, extensions, and uh, we have to support the flow experience. We put much, much effort on getting very clean, intuitive APIs, so uh, we call people uh, in the middle of the night what do you think? How should this method be called? Uh, what do you think is more intuitive? And um, so the first response uh, is usually the most intuitive one, and that's what we take then. Uh, usually the response is, do you know what time it is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, we neglect that. Um, so, and very important is to get everything consistent. That's, to be honest, is uh, yeah quite nagging sometimes. Imagine you have um, used a certain naming scheme somewhere, and after one year you figure out, well, it was not that a good idea to name it all that, because today we found the real cool name for this, and so you have to actually refactor everything um, again. But what we do is, currently we have the big uh, freedom to do that because we don't have a release out yet. So we don't have to care about backwards compatibility. And I think this fact that we could change everything completely over the last two years, um, that, that improved the whole quality a lot. And um, many APIs haven't changed for quite some time now, so we're quite confident that we can leave it like that now and go for a first release. So, um, it's important to know, though, that Flow3 is not kind of a side project we are doing as a hobby uh, besides our development on version 5. Um, Flow3 is um, the foundation of Typo3.5 and it's the shortest way we could take um, in, in order to prepare that foundation for version 5, so it's absolutely necessary. Of course, what we could have skipped is creating a logo for Flow3 and creating a website for that sub-product. 
But uh, we find that it's very, very important to spread that uh, for the whole PHP community because the more people use the framework, the more stable it gets and uh, um, the better the API gets. So we are very highly interested in that the whole PHP community uses it. Um, mainly, uh, Flow 3 consists of these sub-packages currently and it's always difficult to select some um, to present. So uh, we've heard so many years now, <laughs> you heard about AOP and uh, um, dependency injection and uh, many other things. And maybe I can address some, some of these topics tomorrow again. Uh, but today I want to get more uh, into not all the theory behind it, but show you some actual code and how to get started. Because, um, yeah, I, I really think that if you have um, a project which is well suited for that, you should start now using Flow 3. It's absolutely possible to do that. Um, actually, XBase is equally stable like Flow 3. Uh, if you, um, well, the, the content repository is a special thing because it's uh, still slow and we are um, aware of that, but, but still, it's quite stable to use it. Um, so what are the requirements for Flow 3? Um, you need PHP 5.3. Uh, there's a release candidate 3 next week uh, coming. So um, finally, they will be able to release a final release at some point. And in the beginning, uh, we were so optimistic that we chose PHP 6. But uh, well, <laughs> you know that story. Um, so what you need is PHP 5.3 because we use namespaces in Flow 3 and you need some database that could be SQLite and um, a web server would be cool as well, although it's not required. Um, so you download it from Subversion and as I said uh, on, I don't know, some days ago, when was the keynote? Um, we'll have a first uh, release on June 1st and our strategy with uh, the Flow 3 releases is that if we feel like the main concepts are in place now, the API is stable enough that you should look at it, so we'll have a first release on June 1st. And from then on, we'll have each month, the first weekday of the month, we'll have a Flow 3 release. In the beginning, it will be alpha releases only, but uh, at some point, we'll have beta releases. And when Flow 3 finally is out, we'll have a stable release every month that's, um, I hope nobody records that on video now, but um, <laughs> this is, uh, we think that it would be cool to have that because um, there would be uh, def uh, releases, so bug fix releases um, within a month that could be 15 releases in a month. So what, what we plan for is to make that completely automized, um, also producing the release nodes, etc. So you don't have to wait for a bug fix being integrated in Flow 3 for half a year or so. And I think all this release uh, model is possible with a framework, actually, like Flow 3 is. Okay, so you download that stuff from Subversion and finally uh, in June you, you have a package to download. And <clears throat> then you make, have to make sure that uh, there's a write permission for, uh, for certain directories. Um, that is basically the showstopper because someone downloads it and then doesn't, you know, extracts it and it has the wrong uh, owner on the web server. And because that's the case, we, what we plan is some self-extracting PHP file, um, a FAR um, file actually. So by that, we make sure if you have write permissions for the directory, you put that self-extracting Flow 3 file in. Uh, it's also granted that uh, you have access to the directories you create because the web server creates it itself. Um, before I sh show you some, some uh, code, I'd like to only mention Model View Controller again because um, you never can be sure that everybody uh, does everything with model view controllers. Absolutely familiar with that. So it's a repetition for most of you. I hope only one, two don't know about that. Um, we have the model, and 
Um, as you've also seen um, in the uh, XBase talk, the model contains data and also business logic that's important. We have a richer model in Flow 3, which is called a domain model. Um, then we have the view, which is only responsible of representation. So we're using Fluid as a template engine, but you can, of course, also create your very own uh, view classes. And it's important that you don't put any business logic into these views. Finally, we have the controller, uh, which is the central hub. So the controller um, takes the user input, uh, decides on which view to show, and um, um, manipulates the model if necessary, and then uh, finally responds to the request. We have uh, the most used controller is the action controller, of course. So. Um, um, as you know from a certain uh, regular website uh, or for uh, basic data operations, you have something like the CRUD options, so uh, create, read, update, delete functions. These are typical things <coughs> an action controller does. Um, yes, and probably when you've worked with a different uh, framework already, uh, there's also this concept of actions and um, there are different, way, different ways how an action accesses the user input. And usually what you get as user input is um, get parameters or post parameters from a form you submit um, or in a get parameters from a URL. And the basic problem with that is that um, there are security issues, of course, if you just use this information. And um, also, um, you have to know where to get this uh, input. So usually what you do is you use the PHP superglobals, dollar underscore get and dollar underscore post. But of course, this input is completely unchecked and uh, can contain uh, serious, um, or can, can cause serious trouble with uh, your database SQL injection. It can uh, be the root of uh, cross-site scripting. So what we decided to do is um, we have action methods like this one. I hope you can see it there, um, which is just a regular PHP method. And the argument you get from outside is just a regular argument to that method. So Basically, uh, you're completely unaware of the fact that you're creating a web application. It's just, and in fact, you can, of course, also use it for the command line or um, any other platform. So this show action here gets a post. This is the block example. Yeah. Um, and this is the thing uh, we've been working on for, for really a few months. Um, because every time we try to get it simpler and simpler. In the beginning, we had a show action which um, got some UID of a post. And then you and the controller had to fetch uh, the post from the uh, content repository or from a database or whatever. So you had to take care of all that database operation. And we thought that um, it's much easier if you actually get a post object. Why should you care about um, where, how to get this post, actually. So we created a mechanism which automatically makes sure that you get only objects, or of course you can also get strings if you want to have an email address or so. Uh, yeah, and I'll just show you that in a concrete example. Do you have any questions already or suggestions? Anybody awake? I will do something against that. Um, okay, so f def f3 blog, and uh, Euler actually said that uh, yeah, you always got this blog example, and of course um, uh, you you got to know that. Um, we don't have a customer in the Type 3.5 uh, 
team, uh, development team. Of course, we have you, the community, who gives us advice, but we don't have a customer which calls us uh, every day and says, ah, but we need this feature, and, and they specify it, etc. So, um, it's a very bad idea to create just a framework um, with functions you think could be useful. <laughs> That's always a bad idea. So, what we need is a real-world example. Of course, for Flow 3, we have the best real-world example we can imagine. We create a CMS, actually. That's, that's quite a good uh, real-world example. So what we do um, in order to assign the task to ourselves is um, we think about, OK, what do we want to do in the back end, for example? There should be a page tree. And we want to be able to create a page. And what's necessary? Um, to get that done technically. And then we calculate, yeah, yeah, for a bridge tree we need pages, and so we need domain model, and, and then we need security and all that. So this is how we find, try to find the shortest way how to develop that. And for a CMS, it can be that big a chunk you have to develop before you can log into a backend, of course. So we have that smaller example here, the blog example, which is a standalone application, has also some uh, business logic in there and also some requirements. And this was, uh, for, for quite some time, the perfect way to, t to check out uh, if we are on the, wrong, uh, right, on the right path. <laughs> so, okay, so you got uh, this block example here. And, well, uh, some people say Flow 3 is uh, slow. Is it slow? No, it's, it's not slow. This is um, the development context. Um, that means certain things are not cached. So it should be even slower in uh, production context. Um, and, well, that's not... Okay, we don't have posts here, and so it's, it's not really fancy. Um, but what you can see is you have all the basic operations, so you can edit uh, this context. And um, if you would see this uh, address line here in slow motion, because it's so fast you hardly can see it, uh, um, if I go to this delete uh, link here, uh, what you can see down there, uh, no, you cannot. What you cannot see down there is that it points to a uh, URL uh, blocks slash production slash delete, and production is the name of the blog, of course. So it will now jump to delete and then immediately redirect to the index view again. Like, blah, have you seen that? No, it's already gone. Um, Okay, so this is the, the absolutely fancy um, block example. And uh, as you've seen in the XBase code, of course, I mean, there's some reason that there are some similarities between XBase and Flow3. Basically, uh, we took most of XBase and ported that to Flow3, <laughs> including uh, the block example. Um, here is it. Uh, I'll just uh, open this whole directory. Uh, I must say that I'm not really the text made user, but it seems like it's. People say that it's good for demonstration purposes because you can make the font bigger and so cool. Um, do you have any questions about the directory structure? Because I would just skip that if it's, if it's completely intuitive and you've seen that so many times. So there's packages, a controller. And so we have the block controller. Uh, is it white on white? No. Um, OK. So I won't uh, um, go through every line one by one, although we could do that because we have lots of time in this talk. And actually, you have to write so few lines. Um, so, of course, uh, this controller can use any view you like, but what we like to use is Fluid. And uh, therefore, uh, what we currently have to... Uh, can you read that? Yeah. 
here. What we, what we have to uh, declare here is the default ob uh, view object name, and that is the fluid template view. Yeah? Um, let's look at the index action. The index action is uh, what displays the list of blocks, and what it does is uh, it fetches all blocks from the block repository. Do you, by the way, do you, uh, what do you think about all this domain-driven design, repository, domain model thing? Does uh, that now, after all these years, um, make click with, <laughs> with you? Uh, also, um, after the X-based um, talk, do you think it's, or can you understand that, that you fetch a block from a repository? Yeah? Cool. <laughs> it's so easy once you get into that. So um, I tell the block repository to find all blocks, and um, that's the result is an array of block objects. And I s assign that to a fluid variable called blocks. And well, then the view is aut automatically rendered because I didn't uh, state anything else here. Let's. Um, I'd like to show you something. I return x here, yeah, in the index action. And what happens now is uh, nothing. And <laughs> the reason for that is um, that I'm probably in the wrong directory. <laughs> Let's see why it's uh, the case. Um, yes, I am. <laughs> That's a um, very nice uh, uh, source for confusion. <laughs> so here I got the block example. I have seen talks where people spend 20 minutes <laughs> finding out. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, in total, it was a 30 minute talk. <laughs> But I have so much time. <laughs> um, so I return x here, and what actually happens is um, x. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, isn't that cool? You can output any character you like. <laughs> we should try it with a b, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, it, it takes a bit longer. B is <laughs> costs more performance. Um, and the uh, mechanism behind it is, if your action doesn't return anything, it will automatically render the automatically resolved view. And that view is automatically resolved by, I mean, we gave it a hint, of course. <laughs> but um, basically what Fluid does is it checks What's the name of the package? What's the name of the controller? What's the name of the action? And there you have the directory structure uh, with the HTML templates. Um, you see, uh, you got the templates here. Block, that's the name of the controller. Then we have the index HTML. And this is the uh, fluid template. Um, I can enter something here. Hooray. And yeah, let's see if um, that appears. So you see, uh, this is really the template. And you, s you also see it was not cached, obviously, so it's even fast, I mean, although we don't cache it. Actually, there are lots of caching mechanisms in place already in Flow3, what, but what we completely don't have yet is um, caching of the whole page or the whole output. So. In, in type of three terms, everything is uncached, but only certain aspects of flow three are cached. Uh, I'll come to that later. So you've seen the amazing index action, and um, well, there's a difference to XBase, and uh, that is, we have a block repository here, but where, where does it come from? I mean, we have to get this block repository as, uh, some way, and usually, uh, what you would, would have done uh, in Flow 3 is you use dependency injection. For example, something called setter injection. So you say uh, inject repository, or even better, block repository, and um, F3 uh, block domain model B 
block repository. And then you assign it to uh, this block repository equals block repository. And well, we have spent almost the whole winter in our dark office to writing these methods. And we thought you didn't like to do that. Although um, it's still very, um, well, very transparent how it works now because the framework uh, calls that method and gives you a block repository and it detects what you want to have by analyzing the type hint here. But um, this is basically what uh, any other dependency injection framework also can do in the Java world, for example. But one thing no other framework can do is what we call property injection. And uh, I hope no other framework can do that, but I, I feel like I invented it. Um, <laughs> maybe I read about it somewhere. But um, So what you have to do is you simply uh, declare a protected block repository here, and you use proper documentation, and then you add this inject annotation, and Flow3 will make sure that you get the uh, block repository automatically re injected. Okay. Um, yeah. S still no questions? <laughs> Absolutely not. So, um, if you look at uh, the show action, for example, um, you see that it gets a block object. Um, but how does Flow3 know that you want a block object? And um, um, why don't you get one? So let's look at um, the show HTML file, for example. Uh, the fluid template, there you see that um, the block is displayed. So this is the uh, syntax for displaying the name of the block, for example. And here you got the description of the block. So uh, what you need is a block object to pass to the fluid object. So that's, that's clear. And if you go to the index template, where all the blocks are listed, and this is now a bit, uh, I wouldn't say messy, but uh, not so easily to, to spot. Um, so you see here, there's an unordered list. Uh, can you see that? Is it better than that? Yeah. So an unordered list, and we want to create a list of blocks. So we create a for loop. Um, and this index um, template needs a variable called blocks, and that's an array of block objects. So it iterates over the blocks, and this S here means that um, within this loop you have a new variable available, block, and that's the current block you're iterating over. So, very easy, if you know PHP, for example. Um, and what we want to do is we want to display the name of the block and create a link, wrap a link around it, which points to the show action uh, to show this particular block, right? Um, so you use the flu um, fluid action link here, and I guess it will, it usually on, on Tuesdays, the name of this tag here changes. Uh, Sebastian is very creative uh, about that, and I've heard that next week it will be called differently again. Uh, did you agree on a name, actually? Yes. Yeah? Uh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you see? <laughs> it's the weekly password. Link.action. Link .action. So be prepared. <laughs> Fortunately, there's no documentation where you can look it up, but <laughs> I mean, you can read source code. So we have an action link here, and the cool thing um, about the combination of Fluid and Flow3 is, and of course XBase is, um, you pass an argument to your post controller here, and the argument is called block. This is what you defined in your PHP method. So if you look at the show action, um, because you called it block here, it's also block and fluid. So I could 
I, I just call it bloggy, yeah? <laughs> uh, and because I'm very orderly, I do change it here as well. So, um, what happens now if I click on the shell link? So, that worked because the link was already... Uh, Huh. It shouldn't work anymore. Sorry? That's true. But how does it get a... Ah. Uh, yeah, okay, so Fluid doesn't throw an error if you um, use something. Ah, that can't be the... Anyway. Uh, I guess it's cached. Blog? Blog. Let's see, uh, slow. Okay, so it points to, um, yeah. Um, there's, there's an argument uh, Fluid uh, uses there, which is unknown to the routing mechanism which creates the link. So this is kind of the real URL in Flow3. So um, because it cannot find a route uh, with such an argument, it, uh, takes the next route which matches, which is, um, ah, that's not true, <laughs> anyway. Uh, but we don't want to break it anyway, because uh, then the next examples won't work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Time. Yeah, we, uh, of course, I mean, we could completely rewrite it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should. Um, I, uh, I just really want to demonstrate that. I, I create a new uh, argument in the index action, and let's, let's see what happens. I want to see an error. Yeah. So, finally it works. So it says, the required property foo doesn't exist. <coughs> so uh, you see that uh, if you create a new argument here, it's also required. Um, so if, if we create, um, oh, we could pass it if, you f if foo, foo equals one, and now it works again. Yeah, if you if pass it as a get parameter up there, um, then there's something which can be passed to your index action. Of course, you can make that optional. Foos. <laughs> um, so, and then, flow three won't complain again. Um, so basically, <coughs> uh, I, I was uh, showing this, this link here. So basically what you uh, have to do in order to point to a single block to pass it to the f um, show action is you define uh, the name of the argument here is block and what you want to pass it is block. So in this case, it has the same name, which might be confusing for you. But the first thing is the name of the argument in the show action. And the second, second thing is what I defined here. Yeah? I could call it single block. And treat it like this. So you, can you follow me? And, well, the cool thing about this is Imagine, uh, I mean, actually it creates a link and, uh, or you can also use it for forms. And usually what you have to do is you have to create a hidden field which contains a UID or you have to pass a get uh, parameter to your link which contains the UID. But here in this case you pass it just the object and the framework knows how to transport the identity through the request to the show action and at the other end uh, an object will come out automatically. So um, I think this is really cool that you can work only with objects on both sides and you don't care about UIDs anymore. Actually you won't see a UID or UUID in Flow3 usually. It's completely hidden. Yes, Ben. <laughs> <laughs>
Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, for sure. Ah, okay, okay. Um, so you, you've not been at the fluid talk by Sebastian. Yes. Yeah, you've been there. Yeah. 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 That's what I was particularly interested in. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can say a little bit about that. So the logic in this template. Um, yeah, basically, the the big advantage of fluid. Of, oops. Of course. Oh, no. Of course, is that um, basically you have an HTML file which completely validates, and that's. That's an important thing to have. Oh, I need some power. And um, uh, so what Sebastian did is um, he created these new custom tags which are prefixed with uh, F. Is there power here? And <coughs> yeah. And usually what other template engines do, if, if, if you want to have some logic in your template, like loops or uh, link generation or some view helpers, uh, other template engines usually uh, let you do that in PHP somehow in your template. And, uh, well, we got some problems with that, of course. It doesn't feel good, if, because then you have all the power. Um, and by introducing these special tags, uh, we can give it a certain dose of power. Things we, sh we think make sense in a view, in a template. So what makes sense is um, it couldn't condition, for example. You see, there's this uh, if block here. If blocks exist at all and contains blocks, then um, all this here uh, is rendered. And if not, I render uh, create your first block and a link how to create your first block. So this is something which really makes sense to have in your template. And uh, because you don't have to care about the technical background, I mean, I could imagine that um, a skilled designer or HTML developer will have a very easy time to learn, uh, let's say, five tags and the logic behind it, and that you say, here, this is blocks, that are the blocks you're getting. So thinking in terms of objects there is much easier to, than to say, yeah, and there you have a nested array and there are some properties there, and um, it's much easier. Just on the same topic, uh, how do you manage the, the kind of separation with, between the, the, the real content, the text, and the, the, the structure? In other words, uh, for multilingual websites, for instance, how do you manage, manage translations? Uh, I, I see this example as quite difficult to handle because you will have to put the translations of every little block. Yeah. Um, there are two different ways to do that. Either you have a completely um, separate HTML template for a different language, could be, but uh, usually what you do is um, you don't have the, the text here hard-coded in there. Um, in, in case of Typo 3, of course, you will have that either in a local lang language or it comes from content elements, whatever, and uh, that is realized by some view helper. So, um, basically, this F action link here is a class which really exists in PHP, which you pass some arguments and that's also possible for localization. So there will be a, a few helper which allows you to please get me that label and insert it here. And uh, then your HTML template won't contain any language dependent content. Okay. Yes. So this, this is not really a part of the CMS layer, but this, this is really an, an application. Yeah. Exactly. So there's absolutely no CMS in here. Um, and I'll, in a second, I'll show you a second uh, application. Yeah, the question I yeah. had in the beginning was wondering, I mean, you said uh, there's a lot of interest also from the PHP community. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah, they they have many ideas, and currently they would use, uh, of course, other frameworks like Symfony or Zen Framework for that. And what we love to see is that they use Flow 3 for it, because then they produce code which we also can use in Type 3 5, because it, that's all compatible. So we have a CMS uh, which uses Flow 3, but we can also create standalone applications and share the code, and that's a cool thing to have, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I just have to see if that I got some. Yeah. Um, so I, I I think you more or less can can see um, how arguments are now passed to some actions. So what you actually have to do is. Um, you define it in your action method that you want to have a new argument and um, have to make sure that in the template there's something passed to your action and that it has the same name. Um, but let's look at uh, the new action, for example, here, um, and the create action. If you create a new block, you want to make sure that the name follows a certain convention and doesn't contain um, malicious HTML code or JavaScript, whatever. So you have to check that at some point. And um, what we really want to do in Flow 3 is separate the, separate the concerns. So in, in the controller, you're not concerned about security or checking your input. That should be done by the framework somehow. And validation also didn't, doesn't belong to that. What you want to control is the application flow, actually. So the new action, um, basically, it's usually an empty action, because what it does is it renders the form which allows you to create a new block, right? Um, and when you submit that, the create action is called. Um, I'll just uh, show you the, the new HTML file here. Oops. So what you see here is a form, just a regular form, and we use a view helper for that. And we have a label here and a text box that is an input field for the property name of the new block. Yeah? So well, you have to get a bit more into Fluid to completely see that. But uh, what happens is you define here that an argument called new block uh, is filled with properties of this form. And then when you submit it, the create action uh, receives an argument called new block, which actually is a block object with the properties you sent in the form. So you don't get an array of properties sent or something, you get the new block. So the only thing you have to do in your create action is add the new block to your block repository, and then it's automatically stored in the content repository and is available. If you don't do that, nothing happens. Uh, the new block is discarded after the request, and it's not added to your content repository. So this is where you decide, do you want that block or not? Um, but as I said, you have to validate the content somehow, and you have to create rules for that. I abuse the index action for that purpose now. Um, I say that uh, our index action needs an argument email address, right? So, the orderly guy I am, uh, I comment that um, and write it correctly. So if you call the index action now, uh, it, it will fail, of course. <coughs> Hopefully, of course. <laughs> um, because email address has not been passed to your function. So I pass it an email address now here manually. Email <coughs> address <coughs> equals foo. So now it works. 
But the point is, we want to validate that it really is an, if, an email address. And you can do that in different ways. One of them is you add a validate tag. Validate email address. And then what you add is the name of a validator. There are some built-in validators. One, is, one of them is called email address. Oh, yeah. Have you seen that here? So you say the argument email address should be validated by the validator email address. Now, if I run this again, uh, I get some error. Not a nice error message, but still, it says the given subject was not a valid email address. Yeah. So if I change this to something valid, it works. So this is how you um, easily can create ad hoc um, validation rules in your action. But usually, you don't want to have validation rules in your action only. You want to have it in a more central place. And um, I can show you something. I create a new block now, and I choose the name flow3. And I know that <clears throat> this application here doesn't allow me to create a block called flow3. You see? It says flow3 can't be used as a block name and some weird error number here. I must say that the way how this is uh, displayed of, is all preliminary and uh, not final, but, but still, it detected somehow, aha, uh -huh, you cannot create a um, block which is called flow3. And if you look at into the code here, there is no such validation uh, in the create action where it happens. Um, so it seems like there are validation rules attached to the block model. You say if you don't can, cannot follow me, right? Um, so let's look at the directory here, and what you see here is there's a block validator. Um, a validator is a very easy class. It only contains, usually it only contains one method, is valid, and you get what needs to be checked. And here I can check if it's not a block uh, object, it's not valid, of course. And if the name is flow3, it's also not valid. So this is something I very easily can um, program. And you don't have to register that validator somewhere. The only thing you have to make sure is that you choose the same name like the model and use the suffix validator for the class name. And for instance, you would have in, in the backend uh, uh, module where you can add these validation uh, words, maybe, or something like that? You mean that a user can define these validation rules? And you must see that um, validation uh, happens in a, in a certain uh, sequence and at certain times. And I, I show you just one other example, and then I show you, give you the big picture when what is um, validated. Um, this is a very specific validator. Just a second. Uh, specific validator which checks the block object as a whole. So what you could uh, write into this is uh, this block is only valid if the name has three characters and the description at least five, at least. But if the name, uh, the key is uh, flow3, then I don't care about the description. Logic like that. Mm -hmm. um, what you also can do is you have validate annotations in the block model itself. So you see that the block name must be alphanumeric, that means uh, characters and numbers but no spaces, and it must be at least three characters long and uh, at the max 50. So we can try that out. Um, <coughs> F2 shouldn't be allowed. 
And then you see the length of a given string was not between 3 and 50. So, um, um, that depends on the validator. I'm not sure about the alphanumeric validator, what it allows. Um, yeah. Ah. Uh, Yeah, okay, it's not alphanumeric. Um, we'll take care of that because uh, originally, as I said, we would uh, wanted to use PHP 6, which allows you to have Unicode functions, etc. So we have to mm, code around that a bit, but, well, it depends on the validator if that is allowed. Well, the, the main thing is these uh, validation rules here for each property will always be enforced if something is persisted to the content repository. So that means you will never be able to persist a block which doesn't follow these rules. Uh, if you don't check it yourself at some point, at least the content repository will check it. Yes? How would I validate such a field if uh, there's a configuration from TypeScript? <laughs> it's not possible there. Um, there must be some function or you have to see that um, this is now the foundation. So uh, you um, and and if you took, uh, put type of three on top of it, the first question is, uh, is if it makes sense to uh, declare val additional validation rules in TypeScript. That's something we have really careful to think about. But uh, you can make it possible by uh, that if type of three provides a, uh, its own validator, which is chained into this whole mechanism. So all these validators can be chained, and uh, so they can um, be uh, chained by OR and by AND, so th that means you can put a certain logic into the whole chain. So this is validation only for the real model? Yeah, yeah. this is really for the model. Mm -hmm. And, ah, I forgot about your question, sorry. Uh, just a question to the fold structure of uh, flow free and X based. Uh, the question is do the validator or repository uh, classes do have to be in the model folder or not? Because we have an extension which, which has a lot, lots of models, because you have a big extension which needs lots of models, and you have a uh, repository and a validator for every single model. Uh, the folder will be very crumbed, and I think it's not that easy to read then. Yeah. To see how many models I have. Yeah. Um, I also tend to think that we should change it so that we have model, repository, and validator as subfolders. Uh, I, I could imagine that we do that. Generally, everything can be located anywhere and, co and named like you want, uh, but it's, it always gets harder for you if you um, uh, don't follow the convention. So this is, of course, on purpose. Um, one, I want to validate the form for breaking the block. It seems like the, the form is bind to the block somehow, and then I load the block and validate the block object. What if I want to validate the user input before creating something? Yeah, exactly. Very, very good point. Um, good. Did I change something here? No. Um, exactly. So, uh, this block validator. I've written here, which checks the overall object, will also be always enforced when things are persisted. So uh, at persistence time, you have to make sure that all validators which are defined for the model are enforced. But what happens if you have, uh, for example, a multi-step form, and because the block has so many properties that at the first screen, um, you show only few properties, and on the next screen, screen you show more properties. Then, between these requests, the block is not completely valid. Only certain properties are valid. So, the overall block validator would fail, right? So, only certain properties can be valid. And um, that's why. Um, uh, the MVC framework doesn't check the overall validation, so it won't uh, run the block validator. Eventually, not currently, it does, as you've seen. <laughs> um, uh, but it allows you to that uh, it knows which properties have been submitted in your form, and it will only validate these properties. So um, 
if you have then the final step, then you have to uh, make sure yourself that all the rest of the validation rules um, are run. And I hope I understood your question right, that um, if you got user data and, what was it? Before you update it, or before you create it, or before I create a blog, or maybe I have no idea. Maybe a contact formula where I don't need a, a domain object. I just want to send a mail, but I want to validate the formula itself before. Okay. So there are oh, I never thought about that. You would wouldn't have actually an object. You only want to validate a form. Yeah, then you use the form validator, which, well, you have to configure. I mean, it's much easier, of course, if you have a model for the form. Yes, so, so that's maybe related. Is there a form um, No, we don't. I've, of course, this is a very, very important part to get um, a nice form handling and form framework, actually. But we didn't start with that yet. It will be very important. And we have many ideas for... Um, uh, data binding w w with the form to make that also very transparent. So, Entschuldigung. Ay, ay, ay. Everybody awake. <laughs> so, um, the, the idea is that if you want to display a form, for example, which allows you to um, create a block, uh, that it should be just, you know, a matter of here, you got the block, render the form, I want three steps, and I want this and that, and it will make sure that everything is kept in a session. So this is the point, because the block can only be validated if all validation rules uh, are enforced. We have to keep it in a session in between the steps, and this must all be handled by the form framework then. Um, yeah, before I move to a different topic, um, I'd like to point you to the update action. And that was quite tricky. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's nice if everything happens automatically, but also you, have, you need certain control over what's happening, so, um, and you need, it, need to be sure that it works in any case. So if you update a block, um, you submit a form which has the properties, and uh, imagine in the update action, you would only get that block object now, that changed block object. The problem with that would be um, Flow 3 would see, ah, you submitted an update form for a block. It would fetch the block from a content repository, would put in the new properties and pass it to your action. And if you don't do anything, it will automatically persist it like that because it was already in the repository. So, and even worse, um, if something goes wrong before your action is called, there's the new information already in the block object, and even though your update action is not called, this is all persisted. You see? So what we have to make sure is uh, we cannot just put the submitted data in, into the real block object, um, we have to let you do that, because you decide eventually if you really want to update the block or not. So this is why the update action has two arguments. One is the original block, which is unchanged from the repository, which is connected to the repository. So any change you would do on this block object automatically gets persisted. And then we have a clone of that block object. And that is um, identical to the original one, but is not connected to the repository, and ha already contains the new properties which have been submitted. So what you can do in your update action is analyze the new properties of the updated block if they are right for you. And then finally, what you have to do is you replace the original block by the updated block and then everything will be done in the background. So, if you wonder why you have these two arguments, that's the reason.
Um, I mean, I, I sat in some talks yesterday and the day before, and I must say it's so difficult for <sighs> watching <laughs> someone uh, showing code, etc. So I'm, well. It does make sense, Robert. You, I find it very interesting. So. Yeah? yeah? Great. <laughs> <laughs> you are the one. Um, I, I guess not. Maybe ask the rest. Yeah. Um, the night was long, exactly. <laughs> um, so, just to um, mention that, we have lots of inbuilt, uh, built in uh, validators you can use um, float integer, not empty number, UUID, regular expression validators. And I showed the demo already, and there's some, some more things. To be said about security, um, I forgot when the security talk of Andy is. Andy here? Or oh, still sleeping? Yeah, that was also long. I saw, drink, saw him drinking lots of wine yesterday. Um, uh, Andreas Fertner is the uh, author of the security framework for uh, Flow 3 and Type 35, and actually also uh, continues with that in a, a, sum of, a Google Sum of Code project. So, validation is um, maybe part of the security, but not completely. So, uh, you've seen that I put the validator into the um, domain folder of the extension. So, we consider validation as part of the business logic. But, of course, there are other things um, to be considered. Uh, for example, if you look at the delete action, I mean, don't you have questions about the delete action? <laughs> Things like, hey, everybody can delete everything. <laughs> you don't check if there's a user logged in or... Because um, if this would be the delete action for backend users in Type 35, it wouldn't look any different. It wouldn't check anything. Um, and the reason is, that in Typo 3.5 and Flow 3, uh, we use uh, aspect-oriented programming to uh, introduce security by some conventions. That means the security framework knows that, by default, everything in a controller is bad and will <laughs> not allow access to it. But if you have um, a show action, it probably allows you to access that, even if you're not logged in. Depends. And, but it will certainly not allow you to use a delete action. But then you can define rules based on, on some ACL uh, schema that for this controller, the delete action should be allowed for a certain uh, group of people. So this is why you won't see any security-related code in your controller. You can fully concentrate um, on, on your business logic and your workflow. So, although this is now a demo, uh, I don't expect that most pr front-end plugins will have longer methods than these for uh, most, most of the actions, because um, the actual business logic takes place in the model, and, you know, it's basically creating things, deleting things, showing things. Okay, um, questions so far? Yeah. Uh, more basic question. Um, uh, when you started the blog, you had just uh, a virtual host for your blog example. And if I uh, install uh, Flow 3 in my, in my uh, server, I need to go to Flow 3 uh, uh, and then write blog. Uh, how you did that? Because you can. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So um, I think we, as, as the next thing, I'll just show you, well, how would I start a new application with Flow 3? And uh, I mean, what do I really have to set up and how do I access the, that's related to the routing probably. And so how do we really do that? And I see Ben stretching and 
So maybe we need some, I mean, we have so much time. Do you want to uh, have some TT clap to zero? I, I, we could do something. Are you agile? Yeah? Okay. Um, Let's, let's try that. Maybe you all stand up. Um, I, I have some, some, something I want to try with you. Great. Oh. Okay, so we got three groups. Um, so this group here in the middle, do you, are you more the experienced clappers or the beginners. <laughs> okay, I consider you to, uh, being the beginners because you are so few. <laughs> but it's important that um, what you do now, is, it's, it's not that easy. You have to keep the right rhythm. So what you do is just do that. Okay, keep on doing that. And loud. And you are clapping, not too loud, but that you can hear them. And I'll do it one time. You're more the uh, group girl guys. I'll show you. Do that like, like I do. Wait again. <laughs> we can try some advanced stuff later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, everybody's leaving. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Um, uh, Julie said, ah, always this blog example here, we need a real application. So yesterday night, uh, we started to create a real application. And Irene, where, did she leave? No. Ah. Um, she, well, she actually <laughs> did the coding and uh, prepared the templates. And um, I mean, it's not completely fancy application, but something you really know. Um, Okay. Oh. It's Forge. So this is uh, running on Flow 3 here. Actually. You don't believe it. Um, you don't believe it. So we can register a project. I mean, you see that he is only flow three, right? I call that project Ben.
because you're supposed to use it. <laughs> so I submit it. Ah, I get my validation error. Uh, got bent fund in. Ah, okay, so uh, yeah, the text uh, validator doesn't allow that, sorry. We can. <laughs> So we got the new project here. Um, I don't think you have issues yet. <laughs> Do you? Uh, personally. <laughs> um, <laughs> your wife could open some tickets. <laughs> or your kids. Um, uh, let's see if, if I... Uh, yeah, we've seen that errors already worked. Yeah. Okay, so um, there's there's even more in the pipeline. Uh, the the code with the issues we uh, didn't manage to uh, commit, or the other way around. I have the golden goal that I don't do subversion updates before a talk, not at the same day at least. <laughs> Better not. So um, there's more code and. All that code is, of course, in um, in the real forge, uh, and so the, this is kind of the second example we want to play with. But what I, it's I mean, it's just an experiment. But what I could imagine is that um, we just keep on improving it, and maybe eventually we end up with um, a real forge application, which also you can use in, in your uh, agencies and create plugins for it. And the cool thing is these plugins will be compatible with Type 35 completely, of course. You can f greatly integrate all that. So, um, I mean, let's just try it out. Everybody who, who loves to contribute some code, just uh, join us at the mailing list and uh, look. So let's see. Um, did you notice that the Flow 3 forge is much faster than the <laughs> Ruby forge <laughs> stuff? <laughs> and that was even development mode. I hardly dared to run it in production mode. Uh, is it really faster? Oh. I mean, it's it's quite fast. I mean, this is only a laptop. How a server would be. <laughs> um, so there's a, a project called uh, no, it's Forge, of course. Forge package Forge. And because it's Forge within the Forge within the Forge, we have this uh, headline here. Uh, if, if you'd like to join us, then, uh, just sign up here. And um, maybe we go through some, some parts of the code and, and ask Irene how she uh, actually did it. So. Ah, that was the blog example. We, what we need is the forge example. So, um, yeah, I, wh what I intend with this is, I mean, in reality, the forge is not completely uh, different from, from the blog example because it's also basic operations, etc. cetera. Ah, that was Sebastian back there. Um, but um, I'd like to show you how do you get started with such a thing? I mean, how, how do you try out your own application? Uh, just let's, let's do that quickly. So, um, why did I open it in the first place? I need some space here. Okay, so what you need is some space, uh, of course, um, flow three. Uh, 
I just remove this demo stuff here, whatever that was in. Okay, so now we got some empty directory here, and what you need now is uh, some some basic stuff to work with, um, and that you, that you should use the uh, flow three distribution for uh, dev flow three demo. So what I do now is I just check out the flow three distribution from subversion. SVN uh, type three flow three distribution uh, trunk. Who was that? Um, so, as you probably know, um, our subvision uh, directories are using. SVN externals, with, which is a really cool thing. Um, so what in the Flow3 distribution is basically defined, we can check that. Uh, yes. So if you see there's this distribution uh, and we have the basic directory structure there and then we have packages, global, and that's empty. So the actual packages which are part of the distribution are not in there. It's only the uh, kind of the dummy package, if you want. But um, this global directory here contains an SVN uh, property called SVN externals, and uh, there's a list of packages which should be mounted in, and into this place. So it's kind of a symlink. Um, and when you check it out, you see that um, it tells you that fetching external um, links to, to other packages. And uh, in the end, you got in packages global all the packages which are part of the Flow3 distribution. Um, now you can create, um, or I recommend that you create your own um, local packages directory. Uh, and that would be a new package uh, called uh, Forge, for example. Yeah. So now you get um, the global uh, structure here, which automatically is updated whenever the Flow3 distribution is updated. And in the local part here, uh, you got only your package you're currently developing. And, um, well, if you are um, a core developer, you usually have the problem that you have some installations you're playing with. And then you find something you want to change in Type 3 or in Flow 3, and you don't remember in which installation did you actually ch change it. And at some point, you have to commit it again. Right? So um, now I have a duplicate here. This is something I already have in the uh, type th uh, flow three distribution here. So um, I just remove all this and replace it by a symlink. Ah. So I have to do that on the common line. Uh, packages. So this is the place uh, where the global directory of my Flow3 distribution is. This is my master directory from the Flow3 distribution. And um, mm. so, and now I created a symlink to that. So uh, if I change something now in my demo project in Flow3, it's directly in the original distribution and I can later commit it to subversion. Um, so you can have any number of packages directories, whatever is necessary for you and your agency to uh, get things organized uh, cleanly.
Okay. So, but how how do you get started? Um, I mean, we can call it uh, localhost uh, dev flow three demo, and there's a public directory, and um, the first thing is, as I mentioned, the showstopper number one, write permissions. So it tries to access a log file. Um, so the whole data directory must be writable for the Apache and the, also the public directory. So what you can do is uh, you call the fix permissions script uh, with uh, your web user. And now this should work. OK. So what you want to do then is point your virtual host to this public directory, because that's basically the idea that everything else uh, outside the public directory is not accessible from the web. That means that um, all the images and uh, CSS files, etc., you deliver with your package um, are outside the web root, but they are copied automatically to the public directory. Um, and that's something you see... Where was it? For example, here in the block example, um, you see that uh, in the block package you have a resources folder which has a private and a public folder. So, private is something which you don't need to be accessible from the web. That is our templates, for example. The templates are why? Why should they be accessible? Uh, we need the rendered templates, of course. But what we need is all the resources, and this is, uh, well, <laughs> just downloaded from, from our blog, so it's not really well structured, but still, it's um, all the GIF files and CSS files, etc. And what Flow3 does is it looks into the resources folder of your um, package, checks if there's a public folder, and just copies that to the public folder in a certain directory structure. And uh, Fluid and uh, other parts of Type 3.5 will know about all this and make sure that the paths to these uh, public resources are correct. Um, that is something you um, deliver with your package. But what about file admin in Type 3? I mean, we have file admin where you can put some... some uh, additional resources which you want to be accessible from outside, and that still must be possible, of course. Uh, for um, Imagine you have the, the Forge application here. Of course, we can deliver some default templates, but you also want to create your own templates and override them, uh, the default ones. And the file admin in Flow3 is the data resources directory. So. This is a general rule of thumb. The data directory contains all the data. It contains the log files and the database, in this case, tem temporary directory, and also the resources. <coughs> so if you put something into public resources here, uh, it will also be mirrored to the real public directory. So this would be file admin here. Um, yeah, of course, uh, we won't be able to actually uh, program everything uh, Irene did uh, yesterday night. Um, but basically, what the next steps were is we uh, downloaded um, the HTML from Forge and uh, cleaned up the HTML file. Of course, we needed to make sure that uh, all the actual content is not in there anymore. And uh, 
um, it's not, I mean, not completely clean, of course, for these demo purposes. Uh, open with TextMate. So this is basically our layout template. Uh, that is roughly like it was uh, created on Forge. Uh, but you also see that Irene um, replaced certain things like, um, for example, there's a tab on the left side which co shows a list of projects. So Irene created an if condition here, if there are projects, uh, there's a for loop uh, which renders the project name and some show action uh, to the actual project. And what you see here is, I mean, this is the layout file, so your master page template, if you want. And there's a section, a div container called content, and within that, the section content is rendered. And this is provided by your individual templates for the new action, for the show action, etc. That will render the section content. So it's kind of with uh, like like with template voila, you have a page template. This is the page template here, and uh, this f render section would be some some reference to a TypeScript like lib content or something, which actually renders that section. Yeah, you can. You don't have to use a layout. You can uh, just use individual templates for every action. But probably that's well uh, makes only sense in, in very rare cases. Yeah. So that that is you can uh, <coughs> can configure where it is. But uh, if you follow the conventions, it's much easier, of course, and. <coughs> The rule is that ha you have in the resources folder of your uh, package that you have layouts and templates. And if there's something called default HTML in your layouts directory, that's the master page template you're choosing. Um, but you also have to declare that in your template here. So this is the index HTML, uh, so the index action of the project's controller. And here it's defined, use the layout default. If I skip that, it will just output. Uh, yeah, we can try that. Mm. And crunch. Yeah. So this is now the index action without the um, layout. This is only um, what we found in the middle there. This part here. Yeah, and then you uh, create your project controller, um, create an create action, new action, show action, etc., and make sure that the links are used in your templates. Uh, that was basically uh, what Irina did yesterday night. Um, I must say that there are some some uh, things which don't work perfectly yet, of course. And that is related to, I think you asked about the routing, for example. Um, you see in the URL here, now we have projects and new. Um, how does Flow3 know that um, we now use the projects controller and this the new action? OK, that could, could be some optimized thing. But um, if I create on, on a project, for example, I have projects, ban, show. And it must know that um, that here it uses the uh, key of the project. You've, it could also use the name uh, or the description, but how does it know it uses the key? And currently, in this example, it, it is done um, by some PHP code. This uh, currently doesn't work automatically. 
but that will change uh, next week. So, um, forge. So. Forge classes. There's something called. <coughs> ah, first I show you the route. Routes uh, configuration. So in the global configuration, there's a file called routes YAML. Um, sorry? Uh, YAML is uh, yet another uh, another markup language. Um, well, unfortunately, you, I haven't configured uh, TextMate to show the spaces, but. Um, Where's the huh? ah here? So YAML is a format uh, which is very very powerful and very readable for humans. Um, in the beginning, we used uh, some PHP syntax in Flow three for configuration. So actually. Last year already uh, at the developer days, I showed some examples where we tried out, um, I think, eight different configuration formats and tried to think of any case. And we found out that YAML is what's, what's best for us. So you have to be aware that spaces are important and tabs are not allowed in YAML files. So indentation here has a meaning, actually. Um, these are sub items of this major item, for example. <clears throat> so these two routes here have been added for uh, Forge to, be, to run, yeah? Are you going to rename uh, the extension, use another extension? Because this would be like more readable, which is the best file the web server. Because it's Sorry, uh, rename ex extensions? Ah, no, uh, you can't because uh, it's not in the web root. It's not in the public directory. So basically, we assume that you will be able to um, point your virtual host to the public directory. And if you can't, the second option is that um, we provide you with some HD access files, which blocks any access to outside the public directory. And if that not even is possible, well, <laughs> search a new hoster. <laughs> I think that's fair. Um, but we don't have uh, sensitive data in the routing information anyway. So, and yeah? Yeah, you, uh, you should already get error messages. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, okay, now the routing doesn't work, but... Hmm. Um, I, I know that we are, we are using currently the Horde um, uh, YAML parser. So there are basically two things and two well, parses you can use, uh, good parses you can use, that one from Symfony and from the Hort project. And that produces all the information you need. So it uh, produces uh, where, in which line there was a syntax error. So it's, um, it seems. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> this whole syntax here is uh, checked. So, uh, which options you have, etc. That that is all checked. So, um, the only thing you can do wrong here is um, uh, mess up with the identing. But uh, then you also will get an error. And currently, they are not shown, to be honest, um, because. Mm -hmm. uh, because in Symphony, I know sometimes it just uh, shows you that something is broken, and you have but to not what, yeah. Uh, <laughs> in order to, to find the, the place where you messed up. 
Yeah. So yeah, as far as I, I played with the parser, uh, we have all that information which line caused the error. So um,
So I need to identify a project now. How many segments do I need? I need, uh, in this case, for the blog post, two segments, a blog and a date. Ah, no, the date is a date time. So um, I need to split that up into three segments, which is year, month, day. And so the default way of um, creating a URL for this blog post would be, uh, the order would be difficult anyway, but would be year slash month slash day slash blog uh, post title. And, and there you see here, uh, it even needs the blog to be identified because you can have at the same day a post with the same name but in different blocks. So uh, eventually you would have blog name slash year slash month slash date slash post title. And um, well, that, that can be done automatically. And you will be able to um, configure the pattern. For example, you want a different uh, pattern for resolving the date time part. You don't want year, month, date, uh, day, but something different. So you're able to, able to configure that in your routes YAML. Mm. Where do we have that? Um, block here. So here we define that there's a block route part handler and you will be able to set some options like uh, uh, date, time, format, and then you can define your very own date type format, for example. What if uh, can uh, point to the um, top right folder, but to just to the whole package? Uh, can I go to uh, localhost, flow3, public, uh, blog? Yeah, and there are some. Can I can I still use this if I have this? Um, mm -hmm. um, yes, that's still possible. I know that there are some. There, there's a bug currently with uh, re regarding the base URL, as you see. <laughs> so, um, but still, it's it's possible to also use, just point to the directory and and use it. Uh, what we don't want to have is that you have to configure the base URI of your website, like you currently have in Type 3. It's all detected automatically, and it mostly works, but there are some issues we are aware of for exactly this case. Can you reduce the domain records for that? Eh? Hmm? You will use the domain records like a domain record? Or um, uh, yeah, but in your standalone ap application, of course, you don't have domain records. So, um, yeah, that we um, have to use the uh, environment we get from from the Apache server and from PHP and try to calculate some sensible information out of that. And that is something which needs uh, cross-platform testing, of course, a lot. So we, yeah. It works mostly on our computers, and then someone says, no, it doesn't work on my server. But because my operating system only supports 10 character file names and like Windows. <laughs> uh. Ah, by the way, if you use it for the very unlikely event of using Windows with Flow 3, <laughs> um, Irene has some much, much fun with that. We're. Um, and basically, that also applies to Type 3 version 4.3. Uh, we're creating cache files, and lots of them. Uh, where are they? Temporary. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you see that we're creating quite some directory structure here. And well, the problem is there is a, a limitation of characters in Windows, but unfortunately, it's not that you cannot have, let's say, a file name larger than 255 characters. No, it's always the complete path which counts. So that means, depending on where you installed Flow 3, if it's in the top-level directory of your hard disk or some 
you know, other directory, you run into problems. But not always. Only if you have class names which are very long. <laughs> you know, that's a bug very easy to spot. <laughs> Um, so, wh what you end up with is um, you can configure oops, somewhere. Uh, where was it? You, you should know it, I guess. Uh, no, I mean, you can configure the temporary directory for, for Flow 3, and uh, then you should. Ah, oh, yeah, good. Okay, so we take that example. So basically, how configuration works in Flow 3 is you have some general uh, source of configuration options where all configuration options must be in there. So if they are not there, they, are not, they don't exist. Uh, and each package has that. For example, if you want to configure Flow 3 in, in some way, you look into configuration folder of Flow3 in, in, in the Flow3 package. There you got the Flow3 YAML file. Oops. And here you got all the options which are possible, uh, including some comments. Uh, at some later point, we will automatically compile this information into the documentation. So uh, th this configuration file will be the source of documentation also at the same time. So you never run into problems that an option exists, but it's not documented, or it's the documentation is still uh, different. And let's find that, yeah. Here you got the temporary directory base. Ah, and um, yeah, and that can be overridden. So utility, environment, temporary, directory base would be the thing you have to memorize now. And in your installation, you have a global configuration folder where you can put in your uh, configuration specific to your project. And so I can use Temporary, what was it called? Directory base. Like that, for example. Uh, this would now immediately have effect because uh, on all modes, but we have uh, different application contexts, as I s told you. In development context, it's not so fast. In production context, it's faster. But that's not the only reason why we have these contexts. Um, the also, uh, another reason is that in development context, caches, certain caches are flushed automatically while you're working. That's a very important feature. Um, I'll show, show you that in a second. So we have different contexts, and you can have different configuration for each context. So if you put it into the top level here in configuration, it applies to all application contexts. But if you only put it into development, for example, into this Flow3 YAML file, then only in development context uh, this temporary directory will be used. Yeah? And how do you switch the context? Yeah? There are different ways. Uh, one way is to set some environment variable, uh, which you can do in your htaccess file, for example. So what you can do is you set the environment to de development, and then it will run in, in, in development mode. The cool thing about that is you can do that in your virtual host configuration. So you can do like, like I did. Um, I have a virtual host for dev f3 block rob. Uh, which sets the environment variable to uh, development context. And I use the same installation for production context, and the only thing different is the environment variable I set in the Apache virtual host. Um, there are many, many possibilities how you can use that. Of course, we didn't invent that. There are other frameworks who do it like that. And the cool thing is, imagine you have your live website, and you can access the live website with 
either a different port, a different subdomain, whatever you like, and actually see debug output and uh, do certain, th certain things. It's the real live server and only you see the uh, different things. And um, as I said, there are caches for many things. Also, we have code caches because we uh, generate some PHP code. These caches are only flushed automatically in the development context, but not in production context, obviously. So if you change something in certain files, it won't crash on the live website, but you will see the error first in development context. Yeah? Uh, will Flow3 help you to do the deployment for the uh, different environments? Will there be uh, settings for FTP or a database or anything else? Yeah, exactly. So this is um, development and production context. That is just some convention, but you can create your very own context. You could uh, create the... Uh, uh, staging context or um, something else. So um, that configuration then contains all the information which is uh, specific to the server you're developing on, for example, the database, password, etc. And on your production server, you have a different configuration. And we are highly interested into um, making the staging of, of your code as easy as possible. So. Uh, the Flow3 package manager will natively support Subversion, for example, so that you can update a package directly from Subversion. So, yeah. And there must be rollbacks possible, so if you see that, oh, that version doesn't work well, <laughs> you go back to an earlier version. Uh, yeah, we we support FirePHP. Uh, we have, um, yeah, that's that's another huge topic. Maybe we can talk about that tomorrow also. But uh, we have logging, for example, um, and there are different logging backends. So uh, one of them is a file logger. Uh, wrong. Flow three is. So, <laughs> um, ah, so yeah, there's a uh, um, email address equals at bar dot com. True. Uh. Hmm. So, okay. Um. Ah, that is not development context, so that's a different log file. So I should use that one. Um. <coughs> I'm not sure if I'm in the right directory, am I? Yeah. Um, okay, because currently I disabled something in the routing, so uh, you see some cache debug messages here from the router. Um, um, yeah, but one thing yeah, I can show you with that is... Uh, no? Block here. Maybe I changed something in the block. For example, uh, I changed the validation annotation here. Uh -huh. So we're using lots of reflection in Flow3. Reflection is very slow. Um, well, initially, if you don't have any caches to start up just the index action of, of Flow3, take three seconds or so uh, on my computer. <clears throat> so what we do is we reflect all classes, we cr create lots of AOP code, etc. But that only happens once. So now I changed something, and of course that reflection needs to be updated. And what you see now here is um, that the file monitor detected one changed file. 
And then the file monitor is uh, also some sub package in Flow 3, which will check if your files have changed. And it knows that not everything has to be flushed now. It, it only flushes uh, the reflection for the block model here. Um, and because we are using a tagged um, caching approach, that means that you have can have any amount of uh, cache entries which depend on this class, which are tagged with that class name. So if this class changes, all caches are automatically flashed, uh, which have anything to do with that class. So uh, this is also the case for AOP proxy building, etc. So it, it knows how, what to rebuild. Um, by that, that is only active in development context. You don't want to have that file monitor in the production context. Um, but still, for development, it's so much easier because you will never have to flush a cache again while developing. Um, and still, it doesn't take the initial boot up time when all the caches need to be regenerated. So, um, unfortunately, in Type 3.5, the cache, clear cache button will be very, very hidden. <laughs> you won't need it anymore because that mechanism also works for uh, content in the content repository. So if you update a page, it knows what other cache entries need to be flushed automatically. And um, so there's no reason why you should manually uh, flush the cache. I don't know if I have that. Uh, the Firebug currently is a package. Um, I must say it's not perfectly integrated. It's just that you can use it. <laughs> so um, we have a global debug function, which you can call, and that um, can, for example, point to Firebug, and that output is generated then. So, um, or you can use it as a logging backend, for example. All what I've logged here can be logged to Firebug. Uh, maybe I, yeah, because I don't know if I can demonstrate it right now, but. Um, uh, well, uh, if you use the debug function, what is yeah. the default way to handle it? I use it mainly um, as a logging backend, I must say. Um, forge. Who is in here? Um, I have to check it out. Here, um, the way how to uh, find an error if you. Something breaks, or yeah, yeah. I mean, either you use a debugger, <laughs> or um, um, you just uh, write a debug uh, call into the place where you want to uh, check something, or what is uh, much nicer, which I'm going to develop next week. Mm, let's say. Ah, I have an example in the issue tracker. Mm -hmm. In the notation to this, there is a post entry on the close three mailing list from Andreas, I think, mm -hmm. in which he describes how to use the file yes. PHP. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. Some links, how to get it, how to install it, but if you find that, we tried it. It's quite easy to follow the instructions. Okay. So there's uh, a ticket I created yesterday. Um, a new feature I'd like to have annotation based logging also for debug debugging purposes. So uh, imagine you have a method and Usually what you want to know is, is this method called and what arguments have been passed and passed, and what is the return value of that method. This is the most uh, common thing I have during debugging. So what you can do is you just add a log annotation for that method and say log before this method is called. 
And if you don't specify anything else that goes into the system logger, which can be a file-based logger of uh, Fire, PHP, Firebug. And um, you can, of course, specify a different logger, different severity, or create your own message, for example. And now, the cool thing about this is uh, it's not actual PHP code you're writing there. It's not an if uh, condition you're writing there. So in production context, there won won't be any logging code uh, generated if you don't want it to. So um, this won't have any effect on your live performance uh, of your application, but only if, if you really need it for debugging. That means you can leave all your important debugging logging instructions in your code without having any bad side effects for your live application. And, and as I said, of course, on, on the live web server, you can switch into development context, and that means that you can use uh, Firebug for deb debugging your live websites, um, because then the annotations will be in effect only for your development context, but nobody else will see it. Yeah, and you can have something like log after throwing an exception, for example, so um, that method call is only logged if it throws an exception which is not handled, for example. Whoa! Do I have slides, by the way? No, we talked about routing. Um, yeah. Now, I don't want to print it now. Um, yeah, as, as, as you've seen, the blog example is, is available uh, on Forge. Um, it's just a branch of the Flow3 uh, distribution. And the Forge um, example is also available there, so you just check it out and I get a coffee now. Great. Um, Ah, something I didn't show you, which was created by Carsten, thank you. Um, you know that we have the content repository there and Carsten will tell much more about that. But um, if you're interested in how the stuff is stored, we have, ah, oh, that's the wrong website. Um, we have the type of 3 CR admin tool, which eventually become uh, something like PHP My Admin for the content repository. So <clears throat> what you can see in there is the objects you actually stored. So you see you got the uh, tree here with a project domain model, and there you got Ben again. <laughs> So you see the UUID and some internal stuff here. And of course, um, for example, if you created a model and uh, mistyped the property name but already have data persisted, you want to delete that data. And so that's um, easily possible from within this tool because here, of course, you can on a very low level delete objects. Uh, by the way, of course, what needs to be solved still is the whole migration part of content. So what happens if you change your domain model and already have content in the content repository, you have to migrate from one model version to another, and that's not implemented yet either. Robert? Yes? How would the uh, files look here? Files would also be stored here. They could be, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm thinking a little bit dem. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So if you have that dem uh, situation, the d digital asset management, you sure want, why, why should there be a difference between a uh, page you're storing or a f uh, an image or a, a file, PDF file, whatever? So you'll be able to use exactly the same uh, APIs for that. And if um, the... 5,000 gigabyte movie file is really stored in a database, well, 
that can be decided by, by the framework behind that. It could analyze what file type it is, what's efficient. But um, on the API side, it should be just, uh, well, streamlined and easy to use. Um, I, I told you about that automatic publishing of files uh, from the public directory, etc. That is um, a sub package called resource. Uh, so we have the resource manager there. And that, honestly, that is only a placeholder currently. That's the worst code we currently have in Flow 3. We only had to make it possible somehow. Uh, but that will be the interesting part for things like the DAM, etc. Um, where um, the content can be in the content repository, for example, and the first time you access it, it's mirrored to the public directory. And if you, uh, then you can check, for example, has that PDF file been accessed in the last three months from someone outside there? No, it hasn't. So you can automatically delete it again from the public directory. And if someone requests it again, it takes a bit longer, but then it will fetch it again from the content repository, mirrored. So you got all that automized. You can have things like uh, rest uh, restrictions on who is able to access that PDF file. Can they download it three times or four times? And um, do they need a token for that? Do they need to be logged in? So you can decide that on, on file level, actually. You need some drumming session again, I guess. Fresh air. Yeah, and fresh air. So, yeah, I, what I would really love to see is that you play around with that and, and uh, really let me know about the experience, even if, if it's completely disappointing what you experience, but please let us know. Yeah. Uh-huh. Exactly. So the block package currently doesn't contain any routing information. We also have a ticket for that you be able that your package is able to deliver a sub route, but you still will have to integrate that sub route in your global route. And in the beginning, it was so that each package could uh, just have routing information, and that was compiled. But the problem was that the order how that happens is not defined. It's not uh, determined. Because, I mean, it depends basically on with what character your package key starts. And that's not a good way to handle routing. So, uh, But it will be possible that, for example, your block package delivers some routing sub-routes which make sense for the block package, and you will be able to use that in your global routing information. So you still need to configure it in your way. Yeah. And we'll see how that will work in type 3, for example, if, if that can be done automatically for front-end plugins or and what user interface we have for that. <coughs> but it's basically like include static type of script or not. Um, so include this routing information from the package or not. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, you should check out the distribution to get get it really running. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, they have lots of fun there. Whoa! <laughs> we missed something. Okay, and yeah, keep in mind it's all fast. You've seen how fast it is. It was so. <laughs> yeah. Um, usually I use APC, but I haven't, don't have that enabled currently because I experienced some bad things on Tuesday where, well, things happened which I didn't expect and then I had to restart Apache and everything was nice again. So, it's, uh, with PHP 5.3 Release Candidate 2, I had some problems with APC, but... So, this is now without APC. Okay, should we get some fresh air? Yeah. Cool.
read these books, right? Yeah, you can see. Um, go, just go to the Flow 3 website and read all these books and, and stuff. Okay.